All right, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning and the impact it's going to have in FPNA. All right, so as Sarita mentioned, born and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana. Any Hoosier fans here? Any big Hoosier? Who, who? Hoosiers? Yeah. Hey, we're back. We just got Romeo Langford. IU basketball is back. Uh, so graduated from the IU Kelly School of Business. Uh, funny story about that. So I originally started off as a marketing major. So I came into IU, um, and I was like, man, I love marketing. It's so creative. It's like the, you know, the four Ps of marketing. I could be super creative. And then uh, Sarbanes-Oxley happened, right? So people got, some people got smoked, and accountants and auditors became in demand. And IU, uh, the big four, was heavily recruited out there. So I took a lot of accounting and finance classes in high school. So I was like, hey, I'll try this out. I guarantee to have a job. So I've been on the accounting and finance road ever since. Uh, I got an MBA in corporate finance, um, senior finance manager at Emarsis, which is the largest independent marketing platform company in the world. 10 plus years of FP&A experience. Primarily what I've uh, had my experience in is high growth, entrepreneurial, fast-paced technology companies. Um, and then I think the number one thing that is important for me is uh, aligning my why, which is utilizing my skills, passions, and talents to help others realize and achieve greatness. So having the opportunity to come present here in front of you guys to be part of the conference uh, is definitely a, a humbling experience for me. So that's just a little bit about me. This picture right here, I am an avid uh, amateur boxer. So my record is eight and two in terms of amateur fights. One thing I've learned in that situation is that there's nothing in business, there's nothing in FP&A, there's nothing in finance that is ever going to be more hurtful than a, than a liver shot to the body. When I tell you that, a liver shot to the body puts you down. I don't care who you are, I don't care who hits you there. So if I can take something like that, I'm pretty sure nothing in business is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, be as, hurt, as, as exhausting as that. So. Um, about Sarita, Sarita is uh, uh, helping me with this session, graduated from IUPUI, CPA. She's actually on my team as the assistant controller. Eight plus years experience. Um, I can tell you one thing about Sarita, there's no better process person that I've ever met in my professional career and I'm humbled to have the opportunity to work with her every day. She's an outstanding professional. So that's just a little bit about Sarita. Uh, the agenda today, guys, what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about what is AI, why is it important for you guys to know? And then I want to give you guys kind of a timeline of how we got here. Where do we come from? Where are we at? And where are we going? And then how is this going to impact FP&A both in short and long-term growth? What are some current technologies out there? What's the outlook for artificial intelligence and machine learning in FP&A? And then how is this going to future impact your teams and organizations? And then we'll kind of have a conclusion um, I like to make my sessions as a lot of the other speakers interactive, so if you do have questions, we can make sure we get to them either online or in, in, uh, in the, the session today. So, I think there's a common misconception on artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? So, artificial intelligence in our profession is, this is not about machines making decisions. I don't think we're at that point in our profession where machines are executing on decisions. Now, in some other industries, like the financial services industries, robotics, and some of these more manufacturing, for instance, uh, these industries, it, there's so much repetition that you have in uh, the transactions. And there's really three key things that you need to really leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning inside your organization. The first thing is you need massive, 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 massive amounts of data. Like you need, I don't even know how much you go above terabytes, but you need like a million of those, right? You need massive amounts of data. The second thing that you need is a history of the data. You need at minimum at least 30 years of transactional history to really leverage artificial intelligence. The third thing that you need is a dope algorithm. So when I mean dope algorithm, when you look at how the, the technology is going to learn, you need an algorithm set up to look through that data, to analyze, to make the predictive kind of analytics piece on it. Those are really the three things that you need in incorporating artificial intelligence and machine learning inside of your processes. So um, I think artificial intelligence and machine learning, another thing that I want to make sure you guys leave with this session understanding, think of artificial intelligence as like the business school, right? 
So I went to the Kelly School of Business. The Kelly School of Business equals artificial intelligence. Machine learning is a major inside the business school. So Kelly School of Business, accounting and finance, that's the same uh, situation that artificial intelligence and machine learning are. They are not one of the same. And in some of the slides later, we'll be able to draw that distinction. So why is this, why is it important for you and what's in it for you sitting in this session? Guys, artificial intelligence and machine learning is here to stay. I go to a lot of these conferences and I think you always hear what the buzzwords are, right? Like, I think last year's 2017's buzzword was like big data. Everything, like you, you can throw big data on anything and it's just like, oh man, I gotta go be there, right? Um, who still hears about big data, right? I think I haven't read any articles or been in any sessions where big data has been like the focal topic of it. But artificial intelligence and machine learning is here. And it's gonna really impact three key areas in our profession and in our organization. It's gonna affect our people, it's gonna affect our processes, it's gonna affect our technologies that we're impacting. So that's why it's important for you guys to be here and that's really what I want you guys to take away. And also it's gonna impact decision making. Right, again, the goal of artificial intelligence and machine learning in accounting and finance is not to make the decision. It is to incorporate the human element at the most optimized and high value time period to make that decision. And we'll get to some examples and we'll get to some success stories where we're really starting to see this momentum of artificial intelligence and machine learning pick up in our profession. Next, okay. So, given what we just talked about earlier, I think this is a good uh, infographic to kind of really distill down artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Artificial intelligence is, uh, you know, it's Siri, it could be robotics, which we had uh, in a session yesterday. It's programs and systems and technologies that's able to interpret, act, or respond to data or transactions, right? Machine learning is the algorithm behind it. It's the aspect of how's, how's this technology, how's this system going to continue to take this massive amount of data, this time period, and the algorithm to continue to learn. And then deep learning, which is, uh, deep learning is a subset which is primarily focused on more of the robotics and more of uh, the uh, internet of things. Really not an area for us in FPNA that we're really going to be leveraging, but artificial intelligence and machine learning are definitely in, in our sweet spot. What are some of those key differences? As I mentioned before, right, artificial intelligence and machine learning are two separate schools of thought, right? Um, when you really look at uh, some success stories in accounting and finance and inside of FPNA teams that are really starting to leverage, the first toll gate that a lot of people are going into is the machine learning aspect, right? And one thing that's really driving machine learning and these algorithms is a profession that back when I was in school, which was not too long ago, but really long ago, I guess I'm like, I'm like an in-between where it's like, oh man, I left school long ago, but I don't feel like I left school long ago, is data scientists, right? Whoever went to school and was like data scientists or like data warehouse people or like this kind of profession was even a thing, right? Like you couldn't go do that. Well, now because of the prevalence of data scientists, one of the first toll gates that companies and organizations and teams are able to adopt machine learning is really on the machine learning side with the algorithms, right? Google's algorithm, uh, Facebook's algorithm, Twitter. When you look at all the most popular software company or technology companies, they are literally built on solid algorithms. Facebook, for instance, right? Think about the level of transactions Facebook has on a daily basis. I was looking at a statistic and Facebook has produced in the last 10 years more data in the entire world than the last 65 years combined. Facebook every day has data. Google has data, so much data that is being consumed. And that's why these algorithms and that first toll gate in machine learning is really being uh, leveraged inside of FP&A and software teams. Some similarities, um, again, they're all technology based, right? Uh, one thing I do want to preference and have you guys leave with, guys, we're going to be laggers in terms of adopting these tools, right? Think about all the requirements that we have, right? How many, how many people in here work for publicly traded companies? Okay, a few of you guys, right? How many people in here have a board of directors or a private equity firm that you report to, right? Mostly everybody in here, right? Um, so when you, when you think about it, we're going to be laggers because all of that information is so important. 
when you look at a when you look at a company like a financial services, a JP Morgan and Chase, right? Every single day is just blocking and tackling the transactions. Right? It's just a lot of transactions. It's just the same sort of thing. It's finding the right point. It's finding the right time to invest or uh, short. It's all transactionally based. But because we're going to be laggers in terms of the re SEC requirements that we have, because we wear a lot of different hats on our teams, artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to be probably laggers for us. But for financial services, for manufacturing, for these older uh, industries, they'll be able to leverage artificial intelligence more closely and more in high demand. Okay, so I kind of talked to you a little bit about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. I kind of want to take a step back and say, okay, how do we get here, Chris? Where, here's, the, here's the timeline of how we get here. So in the 1940s, it was the birth of AI. I can tell you guys, 1940s, like, there was a lot of literature, there was a lot of uh, movement in academia around this concept of like the computer brain, right? So universities, academia were really championing these, these theories around having that at some point in time, there's gonna be a quantitative aspect of a system that is faster in processing in the brain, right? So that was really the birth in the 1940s. A lot of academic cardiac and mailing, a lot of different people putting these theories into place and having the academic mindset around it. But one thing that happened, and people were investing money into it, universities were, uh, high net worth individuals were putting money into these theories, but it got to a point where it was like, guys, we gotta, we gotta start seeing some return. Like, you're having these theories, but we're not seeing anything that validates it, right? And one of the major crux in that time period that moves us into the first winter of artificial intelligence, the level of quantum computing was not there yet. We were not the speeds of technology, the computing power that we had access to, that these theories and these people that are championing these uh, theories and these proposals, it couldn't produce. So you kind of went to the first winter stage, which was people dried up, people said, look, until we start to see positive returns or ROI on the money that we're investing in these theories, we're not gonna continue to invest in that. And also during the 1950s and 80s, obviously we're going through a major recession here in the US. Then you shift forward into, call it the 1990s and uh, 2000, I call it the early 2000s, right? The, the internet boom, right? You could have any technology, you can have a technology company that monitor people that went to work to use a bathroom and you probably would get like $5 million of investment. You'd be like, this is a dope technology, it monitors everybody, I can see how much hours we're losing, and I can deduct it, and they're like, boom, $5 million for you, right? The well was open for technology companies to get money, right? And we had advances in quantum computing, but that same ROI was not there yet. That same ability to be able to test in these theories and to be able to leverage these technologies and the show returns was not there. And also, the big, the internet boom. I mean, the, 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 the amount of money that was lost in that time period is astronomical, right? And investors, VC firms, high net worth individuals became very, very reluctant at giving that capital. So that moved us into the second winner that we got into. So now you fast forward to 2010 and the future, right? This is kind of the phase, so we talked through how we birthed it where the, the winners have stopped and what was some catalyst of, of moving into those winners, and now where are we at now? Where are we at now is you think about how software companies have disrupted so many different markets, right? Look at RIP, let's, let's have a moment for Blockbuster right now. I was reading in the news that they just closed their last store, right? Like, it, that store was a boss. Like, that store was straight G. Like, you know, it was those people in there that had to be like 65, 80 years old. They were like, no, we don't. I don't believe in this internet thing yet, and I don't like Redbox, so I'm just going to go pay $4 for a movie that I can just go get. I mean, seriously, right? Like, technology has destroyed industries, right? Facebook, uh, Uber. Look, look at what Uber has done. And, and think about all these other technologies that are still coming along the way. So technology and its advancement in terms of disrupting traditional markets and traditional industries, that's gonna continue. So that's one observation I see for the future. The second thing is, when you think about the access and how technology has been ingrained in our lives, I think I've seen a cool thing that Brian had where the baby was working on the iPad. Like, did that not blow your mind that a baby is like working an iPad and just can tell like swiping and moving and doing everything like that. 
technology has ingrained in us. And when you look at the, the prevalence of cell phones, when you look at the prevalence of, I remember, and this may, this may age myself, but I remember first cell phone I had, I can only text on it. And it was like the, the, the little black and green letters and stuff on it. And then the first cell phone came out where it was like color cell phones. And then it went crazy where it was like cameras and cell phones. Now you, you think about what we have as cell phones and all the data that's consumed in there, right? The Twitter, the, the Facebook, the Snapchats, the LinkedIn, all these different aspects that we're engaging with on a daily basis. So the second piece of is the amount of data that's created. It's set up a, a great platform for leveraging these artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. And how I see the future is, is at a macro level, when I think about artificial intelligence inside, right, I think one of the coolest things is uh, Google's actually looking at a uh, call center to completely move out and have real life conversations with people. Like they're testing out a concept that Google can have a call center to actually have conversations with people to eliminate a human element of a call center. Right? Like that's, this, these, and these things are all popping up in test cases. And I think as these continue to gain momentum and as these forefronting technology companies like Google, like Microsoft, like Facebook, like IBM, like Oracle, as these big software players continue to leverage in these tools, we're going to continue to see disruption. So that's kind of how we got here, right? Um, now we're going to go into, okay, how does this affect FPNA people distill down in those four, four key areas, right? People, processes, technology, and decision making. So the first one I'll start is with people. Um, I was looking at a great statistic. By the year 2025, millennials are going to make up 75% of the workforce. Let me let that sink in for a little bit. Because some people are like, oh my god, I cannot deal with people like Chris Ortega three out of the four times. Like, please when can I retire, or how the hell can I not have Chris Ortega's anywhere close to me at any point, right? But it's going to change, right? And when you look at FPNA, when you look at our skill set, what, what Noah and uh, uh, Kim got just done talking about, the skill sets that are going to be in demand, technology for our people are going to be monumental. And if your technology that you're leveraging as your BI tool, is like your planning tool, is Excel, Oh, man, that's going to be rough. That's going to be rough, guys. There's so many other technologies out there that are from a BI, business intelligence, from an analysis perspective that when it comes to people, and you look at the millennial demographic, we are technology savvy, right? The second thing that is, I would say a good and bad thing is how you look at it. Our loyalty is ghost. What do I mean by our loyalty is ghost? Right? If we're not learning, if we're not being pushed, if we're not involved in the decision making, if we're not getting new responsibilities, if we're not being challenged, the grass is definitely greener on the other side. So gone are the days where people stay 30 and, and 20 years at companies, right? Loyalty's done. And the second thing is when you look at from a people aspect, from a recruiting perspective, right? That statistic that we just ended off with Noah and Kim, right? Talent management is the next bubble for FPNA, right? It's a it's a it's a it's a employee it's a employer's it's a employee's market right now, which meaning if you're a high potential, high performing person like Sarita, you're gonna have crazy amount of opportunities at you all the time, right? You I mean it just it, LinkedIn pops up all the time to be like, hey, we got this awesome opportunity, right? So how it's going to, how the landscape of artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to affect the people is monumental. And that's everything to us, is our people. The second thing is around processes. So around processes, I like to mention something. This is probably something for you guys to take away. I call it the decision cycle. I think every business has a process that it goes through to actually make decisions. And that decision cycle is as follows. The first area are processes. Processes are the skeletal framework of any business. This is one takeaway, probably one of three takeaways that I had in my public accounting days. Any former Big Four people in here? Yeah. I feel like it's a badge of honor. Like, I feel like I should get EY like, tattooed somewhere up here. That way I walk into like, these conferences and I'm just like, what's up, bro? Like, yeah, what's up? You know? But uh, one thing I learned it in, in my EY days was uh, understanding processes. Processes are the skeletal framework of every successful business. I don't care what widgets you're selling. I don't care what services you're doing. At the end of the day, 
the most microscopic level of your business and your success are your processes. Processes in that decision cycle are the foundation. Processes then drive data. Data then to information. Information to knowledge. Knowledge ultimately to business decision. That's what I call the decision cycle. And that's a key process that artificial intelligence and machine learning in FPNA is going to revolutionize. How is it going to revolutionize? When you look at process to information, in an example, right, the process of getting your GL transactions or the process of uh, looking at your fixed assets to ultimately give to a government agency that you need to be taxed on, right? Processes, GL information extract, which is the data, the data then being consolidated down to a financial statement. That's the kind of information phase. Where artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to really help us, all of that process to information, automated. Out of sight, out of mind. You don't even have to do it. Right? So all those people that are turning and burn, how many people on a monthly basis, like you're turning and burning through Excel files to get that report that you need to get out to your executive team or to get out to that board of directors and you know right now once you leave this conference you're sitting back you're like man I gotta go pull 12 different systems get 12 different Excel files get those 12 Excel files format five like this format the other five like this do text values on this one format this one right right you're living that right I, I, I know some, it's some of my reporting I have to do that stuff imagine all of that automated Imagine you don't even have to focus on that. As soon as you walk in the office the first day, your people that are partnering inside the business, that know the business, that have the insight inside the, when working in the, to build those relationships, they come right into knowledge. Tying this back to my comment earlier, artificial intelligence and machine learning is not here to replace us. In some jobs, yes. Let me just get that out right out the gate. If you're data mining, peace. If you're processing accounts receivable invoices all the time and cash collections, RIP to you. If you're processing AP and putting it in the GL or posting prepaid transactions or posting depreciation and you're just like, yeah, I'm super excited because I'm posting depreciation all day. <laughs> if, if, that, if that's what you love, hey, I'm not knocking anybody though. So let me, just, let me just get that out right out the gate. I'm not knocking you. If that's what I love, if that's what you love to do, and that motivates you every single day to do, to do your great work, more power to you. Probably got about three to four more years where that's going to make you happy. Because all of those different things in that process to information, automated. A technology can come in and do that. Then you've got your people, right? We're strapped with resources. We, we are not a revenue producing unit. I, I have conversations with my direct manager, Itamar, who's over in Vienna, all the time about this. We're not a revenue producing unit, so we can't just, hey, we're going to go hire three more accountants. Nah, we don't have that luxury. But now you have your people focused on the high value activity, which in that decision cycle is knowledge to decision making. So that's how artificial intelligence and machine learning is really going to impact the processes. I talked about it before on technology. Guys, I'm a tech, like technology, I love reading about it. I love learning what the big techs are doing. One of, the most one of the coolest things I see Microsoft doing is uh, they have their Cortana, which is kind of like their Siri kind of thing, and nobody, nobody knows about it. Like, how many people knew about Cortana that Microsoft had? Yeah, exactly, like three or four people, like five, six people. Nobody knows about it. Cortana's a horrible name for artificial intelligence. Like, I would have named him Herman, because I think it would have been, like, cooler. But, like, what's up, Herman? But what Microsoft is starting to do with their Power BI application, and, guys, this is sick. Sick. Follow me on this right here. I got chills when I read about it. They have Cortana, which is their Siri application. They have natural language processing inside of Power BI. They are working on an application where you go, Cortana, what's our sales forecast for the next six months? Ne sales forecast for the next six months is bloop. Could you guys imagine that? You're walking into that revenue meeting, right? I do this all the time. I raise my hand and do it. I'm like, shit, what's our revenue forecast? What's our revenue forecast for the next three months? I know that's going to be the first question, but I'm busy doing this. You know, Sarita's, you know, cracking the whip and putting me back in place. And I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll get back in line. And then I'm like, what's our three-month revenue forecast, right? And you know what you got to do, right? You got to open up that email. You got to type in there, like, forecast. You got to pull up the Excel file. 
and you're trying to do all this five minutes before. Imagine walking that meeting doing that. Imagine walking into that. Our same thing with Salesforce is doing. They're incorporating natural language uh, processing into their technology to ask about pipeline, opportunity creation. Guys, we're going to be at a stage where we as financial professionals are going to have our own financial professional with us that's going to be able to ask questions about our data. Microsoft has already incorporated that. Power BI already has that inside of their application. You can literally type what's revenue and it just pops right up. So technology is going to continue to advance and continue to uh, drive the people and processes together. And ultimately, decision making. Um, as I mentioned, artificial intelligence and machine learning, guys, is not meant to make the decision. Please, do not incorporate artificial intelligence and machine learning making decisions, right? Incorporate it to a point where it makes a recommendation. That's the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning in our space. It's able to make a recommendation. It's able to take data that we don't have to spend time doing. Ultimately, here's the result we need to be. So looking at that three-month revenue forecast, it's looked at 30 years of history. It's looked at massive amounts of data. It's looked at all of our product SKUs broken out. It's looked at seasonality. It's looked at everything. And it said for the next three months, sales are going to be $9 million based on all this data and the algorithm that we set up. Backtest that with our FP&A people now to have your people focused on it. We say, yeah, we're looking at a forecast close to 10 to, to, to 9.5 to 9 million to $10 million, right? Now you have two different test cases. To, you have A-B testing to do. That is the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning in helping in that decision-making process. And the future of AI and machine learning is going to revolutionize the business value and the application that we have in Teams. And that's, direct, that's from the CFO of Amazon. And Amazon is crushing it. They are just murdering everything right now. I mean, they're going to completely de decapitate the bricks and mortar concepts. So if Amazon says it, it it's, like, it's, like the it's like the gospel per Amazon. All right, so what I want to do is take you to some short-term goals of artificial intelligence. This infographic, guys, is, uh, is super important. I don't have a little laser. Do I have a little pointer thing on here? Oh, I do. Nice. All right, so... Again, think about this, artificial intelligence, this is a school of business. These are all majors within inside the school of business. One thing I want to point you guys to, this line down, all the way down here, this is the Internet of Things, this section, right here to down here. We are not going to play ball, unless you're in manufacturing robotics and that's your industries, but FP&A, we're primarily not going to play ball in that area. Where we're going to win and we're going to get, you know, like kind of announcements where LeBron going to the Lakers and it's going to be like our teams like that, we're going to win in this area up here, P particularly around deep learning, predictive analytics and machine learning and some natural language processing. Those are the elements. Predictive analytics, to be able to predict whether it's that revenue forecast or that hiring plan that you need to do, um, deep learning to be able to take in different aspects of your organization to be able to learn and innovate and drive agility. These are areas at fp &A. Guys, we are going to slam dunk. We're going to crush it. We're going to bring so much value to our organizations because we are going to win, not only with our people understanding these and having a passion about it, aligning our processes around being able to incorporate these technologies and ultimately incorporate and find the right technology solution that we are able to incorporate in our team to drive value and decision making in our organization. We are going to win in these areas, right? And some short-term goals, first off, automation, right? The first thing in automation is this. Take this away. Your people are no longer going to do low-value activities. Data extraction, data mining, journal entries, reconciliations, uh, scanning invoices, cash receipts, cash collections, right? Think about all the tactical things your team does, right? All the tactical things are the tactical things on your list that you're looking at. And I, <laughs> I'm not going to I do this all. When I first... Go into the office, I'm like, let me get all my tactical things that I got to do out the way. Like, let me just get this all done so I can just make sure I get this tactical stuff so I can focus on more of the strategic and more of the cool things. Imagine all that your first day, you're right there focused on the strategies. You're focused on the partnership. You're focused on driving the execution. You're focused on driving the business alignment. You're focused on looking at the three to five year planning in your business. You're focused on building the relationships with your sales and marketing group. You are understanding the business. That's going to be a reality for us that we're going to be living in every day. 
Ultimately, we talked about decision making and the agility. So those are some three short-term goals that I see artificial intelligence really impacting our team. Long-term, uh, when I think of short-term, I think of those in like three to five year increments. Long-term is more the five to 10, more decade future scale. We're gonna be able to scale our people. We're gonna be able to scale our function, right? How many people here are, have a team that's deeply entrenched inside the business? Like you would call yourself a true business partner inside of your companies. Okay, a couple, right? Imagine the scale that you're going to have with technologies being able to take away the low value activities, right? You got your same people. You got maybe three of the four of those people that are millennials, preferably not me, right? Cooler millennials than me. Think about now the appetite and think about the capacity that you have now. You got capacity with people. And for us, when we, you know, when we look at our demand and hours and time we have to spend, like capacity is never a luxury, right? It's never a luxury. Demand is always there. Capacity is not always there. But now we have that freedom capacity to focus on other areas. So that's where scale becomes important. Efficiencies, and ultimately this is really big for businesses. Competition. If you are that business that has been, if the first thing you say, well, we've been doing, I, I talked to a CFO when I was in Ohio a couple months ago. A, a group of CFOs were talking, and they, they, they had the, the stance of, well, I don't, you know, we don't have to do this technology stuff. We've been doing business like this for the last 20, 30 years. We're, we're going to be fine. This is just a fad. We're just going to ride this wave. I, I was like, I, I hear what you're saying, and uh, good luck to you. If you look at the last, uh, the last Fortune 1,000 companies in the last 10 years, over 70% of them are no longer even in that Fortune 1,000 category anymore because they had that same mindset. They thought what they did in the past is going to be the same predictor of the future. And they, they, they rested on their, their, their solid salesperson that had all the tribal knowledge. They rested on that CFO that's been with them 35 years. They rested on that accounting and finance team that's been there like 30 years and never had, a never had a person leave. They rested on old principles when it came to people. They rested on old principles when it came to talent management of people. They rested on old principles of technology with just using Excel. That mindset, that management style, that strategy of going into the next future that we're going into RIP, you're going to die, for real. Like, I, there's no other way of saying that. You're not going to make it in this next decade in the long term with some of these tools and these technologies they're going to be able to leverage. So those are, to me, some of the uh, short and long-term goals that I see artificial intelligence deeply impacting our profession. Yeah. There's a question from the audience. Okay. When, when do we believe that machine learning will allow us to do predictive analytics? What was the question, Sharita? By when do we believe that machine learning will allow us to do predictive analytics? Uh, okay, so the question was, by what time do we think uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence will do predictive analytics? Um, that time is now. That time is right now. Now, when you look at professions, though, when I, I, I want to I caveat and say, like, for some industries, it's lagging. But one industry, predictive analytics is already there, financial services. That is, a predictive analytics are, have been there and will continue to develop in that area. Insurance is another industry where it's going to continue to run rampant in that area. Uh, ma manufacturing is another area with robotics and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So to distinctly answer that question, I think it depends on two things. It depends on what industry that you're in, right? That's the first one. What hats your FPA and accounting and finance team are wearing? Um, and when I say hats, a lot of organizations, like, we're just not doing the accounting and finance, right? We may be the operations people. We may be working with HR. We may be the, we may be the HR function. I know someone that was in a session and said, I do everything. Like, I'm the HR person. I'm the accounting person. I'm the finance person. So I think it, that question really depends on those two situations that you're currently in. But for those industries, again, that have the three key things that you need artificial intelligence, large amount of data, at least 30 years of history, and an algorithm you are primed for predictive analytics. Like that is the springboard, the recipe of success for predictive analytics. Uh, one more question. Uh, how do you reconcile the cost and maintenance of automation versus the cost for a human? How do you reconcile, that's a great question. How do you reconcile 
the cost of uh, automation from AI versus people? Well, I think it's, for us, I've always looked at it in, when you say, okay, what time, how much time does it take to close the books, right? Like, everybody looks at their month in close, right? We're going to, we do probably the middle of the month, but I've got the all-star accounting leader, and we're going to push that back to three days, right, Sharita? We're going to push that back three days, right? <laughs> but when you look at, look at your close processes, right? Think about the time it takes if you, if you close at the middle of the month. You close at the middle of the month, let's be honest, you probably have like two, two, three days of forecasting before you're jumping right back in month and close, right? Or you maybe have a week, or you maybe have two days because you're doing all the reporting after month and close, and you got three days of reporting, and then you got two days of presenting everything, and then you're at that like last week, and you're like, oh, we got to jump right back into it. So I think the way of reconciling looking at it is look at the time of your people, Right? Look at those, those tactical accounting items, right? The, the, the scanning of the invoices, the prepaid expenses, and get a tally of here's the time, energy, and effort this is taking us to do. You look at a technology that's able to take away some of that, quantify that in a monthly close, quantify that over a year, you're going to see ROI. And for me, that is always how I've built the case of ROI of incorporating technology, is looking at people's time, right? Because I can't, I can't attribute that I'm going to incorporate artificial intelligence and machine learning inside of accounting and finance that's going to drive sales, right? That's a big stretch. Unless, I'm, unless it's an artificial intelligence or machine learning application that directly impacts our contract management, directly uh, affects our sales opportunities, or more the top line of the business, then you can make that case. But a lot of time, building the case and, the re and reconciling AI versus a person always comes down to the time, energy, and effort of your people. And that's where you have to have laser focus on being able to quantify that picture. But that's how I've done it in, in some organizations I've been a part of. Okay, so jumping into current technologies, um, I've distilled it down to three, three key areas. Business, intelligence, and analysis. Obviously, you have all the big players there. Tableau, Microsoft, Facebook, Hadoop, uh, Cognitive Scale. Um, some of the cool things from a compliance, which is something that when you look at our accounting and FP&A functions, we wear like, I would say, four different hats, right? We're the accountants, we're the FP&A people, we're the compliance people, and we're primarily like the, the reporting people, right? Like that's really our four key areas that we kind of share, right? And we're like the business intelligence, which Noah uh, and Kim kind of mentioned in their last session, right? So we wear a lot of different hats. But the compliance side, um, one example in here is legal robot. Legal robot is dope. And I say it's dope because in our U.S. operations in Marsis U.S., uh, we have the unique opportunity of being a startup inside of a mature business. What do I mean by that? Marsis has been around for 20 plus years. We are based in Vienna, Austria. We started the company in Europe, and that's majorly our foothold. Three years ago, we said, look, our growth, the entire total addressable market from a marketing technology perspective, if you add up the entire world, and compare that to the U.S., it's only 45%. Entire world, total addressable market for marketing technology in the mid to enterprise level customers, which is our target area, you add that to the U.S., it's only 45% of it. So we realized quickly, if we're going to have success, it's going to be in the U.S. And in the U.S., when I started off as the first accounting and finance person, we were 50 employees. It'll be two years in October, and we're at 105, 108 employees. We started off at, uh, you know, pretty nominal revenue amount. We've seen 200% revenue year-over-year year growth in the U.S. And one thing that's been able to help us from a compliance perspective is I use Legal Robot because I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. But the complexity of our enterprise-level deals of the red lines and contracts we've had to read, like that application has tremendously helped me. And we don't have the, I don't have the luxury of saying, hey, Itamar, we need an on-site legal person, which we have now. We have an on-site legal person now. But uh, it's, these are the technology decisions that are able to help you, right? Um, and then also with, with, with the reporting, you've got kind of, you know, your Google Big Data, Intel, Salesforce. You can, uh, NetSuite, they're playing around in there. Um, IBM, I think what IBM is doing with Watson on a whole lot of different, not just financial, but also in the health sciences, in manufacturing, like, IBM is really, really the front runner in terms of artificial intelligence and machine learning in other areas outside of accounting and finance. Like, it's just, it's just amazing. 
And I think what you see with some of these technologies, another key thing I want you to, guys to take away for your teams to think about as you leave here, human personalization does not scale. We as humans, the amount of data being collected, the technologies that are out there, the demands that we have, the limited capacities that we have, this millennial demographic change, our personalization and touching everything is not going to scale. It's a recipe of disaster. You can't throw enough people at the amount of data and technologies and, and process changes that are going to be happening. It is a way to get comfortable with that these technologies and artificial intelligence can begin helping you for that, that, uh, that, that wave that's, that's already here. Um, I want to give some current success stories. So Charles Schwab, um, they use what they call robo-advisors. So like, imagine like planning your retirement, right? And you're not even talking to a human. Like you're planning your retirement, right? For me, I still probably, I don't think I'll ever retire. I think I'll, like, I think I'll be done like, working full time and then I'll just like, present and like, do school stuff. So I don't think I'll ever retire. But imagine going into and like, you're, not even, you're not even talking retirement with a human anymore. Like you're with a robo-advisor that they have data that say, look, this robo-advisor will outperform a human advisor. Charles Schwab, J.P. Morgan and Chase, Citibank, they are already ahead of this robo-advising piece. And it's instantaneous, it's data, it's real time, it's, it's, it's on your phone, it's instant information. A second thing is Compare.com. Compare.com is uh, primarily in the insurance, the auto insurance space, but what it automatically does is if you're going for insurance, and what they've got into is they've branched out not only for insurance, but commercial insurance, some of the insurances that you need to run your business, you put in certain information and it, it automatically populates a list of all the preferred and the insurance policies and companies that, you, you should be, that are advantageous for you automatically. Again, it's a technology that is presenting you recommendations for ultimately you making the decision. It's not making, obviously, the decision for you. Um, another cool one is uh, Sweet, Sweet AP. This one, this is the one that is, is a company that a lot of Fortune 1000 companies are starting to use. It automates the entire AP process. So when you get bills, right, you get bills, it scans it, it looks at the bills, it looks at the history. Most of our bills that you probably get are consistent, right? Like everybody gets their rent every month. Like that's not going to change, right? You probably get your consultants, you probably get uh, your, you know, your, you know, music or whatever, right? Whatever invoices that you get consistently, probably about 80, 90 percent of it is just the same month over month. This technology is able to scan all of that, code it for you, set up payment timelines, make recommendations on when we want to pay based on how you want to float or optimize cash. Like, it has completely taken away the need of having an AP specialist. Completely taken it away. And the second one is collect AI. So that's on the AP side of the shop. When you look at our receivables, right, like, one thing that's important for us at Emarsis US is profits are a reality. Uh, profits are a wish, cash is a reality. It's the number one thing when you're at a high growth entrepreneurial startup company that you look at every single day is cash. And collect AI is the automated AI piece around the accounts receivable side. They actually have a technology that is able to replicate a collection specialist and have conversations on collections. Like, like, you don't need a collections person anymore. Like, leverage the technology to, to increase your collections. And it does the same thing for your receivable side. It does the same thing to look at your invoicing, send it out, find the right emails, have the communications, send you direct aging reports, have follow-up collection. Like, you're able to set up a cadence of how you want to have collections with customers. You're able to identify which customers are at risk based on information that they've seen that you input around the customer. It's able to leverage other technology and other systems to be able to look at to say, hey, this may be a credit risk customer. It does automatic cr credit risk profiles from uh, you know, data that they have with inside credit reporting agencies to able to see, like, has something changed in terms of credit risk? Um, and then the last one is Coupa, which is an AI software and technology around T&E tracking, approval, and audits. So the T&E aspect of when you travel or... Uh, if, you, if you have an organization that has a lot of sales reps that are constantly out in the field and T&E is a big, uh, a big expense or big solution for you, 
this is a technology where you're able to actually leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning inside of your current teams and, and, and companies to be able to take something that you may, you may have had a person, right? How many people in this room have dedicated people to AR and AP? You have dedicated resources to them. Right there, right? I mean, you got dedicated, you got people, right? Fully loaded, you know, you're talking, I don't know, like, I, it, it could depend on reason. But obviously you have a cost of a person, right? Right now, think, guys, there are technologies that you can begin to leverage inside of your group that will eliminate those people. It's going to eliminate them. I mean, because when you, when you look at it, it's, it's, it's taking in the opportunity for being able to look at it and say, okay, this is a resource that we have a dollar amount. This is a technology. It all boils down to ROI. It all boils down to it. And when you have that opportunity to say, we can leverage this technology that gives us 90% of it, that's the future that we're going down. So I wanted to share a little bit of these success stories um, that really take into account some of these technologies. And there's, there's so many more of them. Um, but these are the list of ones that I've seen that have some huge successes with all different kind of companies and all different kind of industries. Okay, so I know I'm going to jump through this quick because I'm running a little bit over. Uh, but, okay, so here's my outlook. The chase for the three eyes. Any software, there's three eyes that are hugely important. The first eye is introduction. The second eye is implementation. The third eye is implementing. I'm sorry, the, the first eye is introduction. The second one is implementing. The third one is integrating. Any software solution that you're going to have successful inside of your organization, the ultimate one is integration. Most companies do a good job of introducing the technology. They do a great job of introducing it, but it's never ingrained. It's never integrated. Integration means that it is part of decision making. It is part of leadership. It is part of guiding the business. A prime example of that, in the US, we didn't have visibility in terms of some of the key KPIs that drive our business. So we introduced Power BI as a solution for us to be able to track this as an organization. We implemented this technology to be front and center inside of our office. Front and center for every employee to know, for every employee to see. We've integrated it as part of our executive and our strategic leadership team meetings. We've integrated to have our CEO and all of our executive team's mobile phones equipped with Power BI. It has been a solution that has produced monumental benefits for us as an organization. But where most companies fail in terms of incorporating any technology is you don't get past that implementation phase. How many of it, right? You've been part of, you get that email that comes across and says, hey, we're rolling out this new technology, right? And this is all hoopla. They do the workshops for it. Six, eight months later, nobody hears about it. Nobody knows about it. Nobody's like, oh, but, but, didn't we do something like this like six, eight months ago? Didn't we do something like this? It's because it never became integrated. So that's the first outlook I have. The investment, um, the investment dollars are back there. I think we're starting to see the level of quantum computing, which were some limitations in the past. We're starting to see those benefits now. So the level of investment, when you look at the big companies starting to do this stuff, it's going to continue to increase. And I wish I would have thrown up this infographic to show you the level of technology companies that are not only in the accounting and finance space, but in legal, in contracts. These companies are sprouting up everywhere that are starting to really incorporate artificial intelligence machine learning. Obviously, we talked about the evolution around people, processes, and technology. Uh, the fourth one I really want to uh, mention and highlight is called Data X. We live in a culture where data is on demand. That's what Data X is. Think of Data X as like we're all staying at this hotel or you're staying at some other hotel, right? Like Data X is this. You want to go see like a dope uh, Marvel movie and you're like, man, I want to go see that. You can instantly go consume that information right now. Facebook, Twitter, it has made information and data so readily available that if you have to go email your CFO or your accounting manager to get anything, that, that's, that's, that's already behind the times. So technology is just going to continue to accelerate this appetite that our stakeholders and that our businesses and teams need to use for data. So that's an outlook that I have around how artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, some of the trends that we're going to have in terms of FP&A. Um, I know I'm running a little bit over, so I'll jump through this. The key part we talked about, I think one thing that I want to say that impacts teams, how this is, uh, 
ultimately where fp and in my, in my vision of the future is where it's going to sit is somewhere between the CFO and COO route. The CFO, because we already have that financial acumen, we know the debits and credits, we know the budgets, we know the actuals, we know the plans, and um, the CEO, because we're partnering inside the business. So when I look at the impact, uh, that's one of the key things that I just want to point out in terms of how that's going to impact teams. All right, so I'll conclude here. AI is coming. It's like winter. That's a pretty dope Game of Thrones uh, memes. I, I couldn't get into Game of Thrones. I got three episodes into it and was like, can't, can't do this. Uh, I wanted to share like how we started here, how to best be prepared, and I'll end on this question. Like, is this good or bad? I think it's the perspective on how you look at it. So it may be bad if you know your your AP specialists or your teams or your you know you're not willing to to reevaluate resources. It may be good when you're starting to say, man, I've got capacity now to optimize things. Um, and I just want to end this last session. Like I know we talked a lot about technology. And I know there's other sessions, but guys, enjoy the ride. This is going to be a fun period for us. It's going to be fun. Change is going to be a constant. And we're going to deliver high value, high activities to our organizations. And we're going to move this entire profession forward. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for your patience. We're going a little bit over and enjoy the rest of the conference.